So uh, hello, my name is Gemma Coxon. I'm a lecturer in hydrology in the School of Geographical Sciences at the University of Bristol. My research focuses on understanding and predicting change in hydroclimatic extremes, so specifically droughts and floods. Um, and I build computer models essentially that tell us what happens when a rainfall drops on the ground and how it kind of enters into our river flow, uh, river systems, um, and how that might change in the future. How about you, Ross? I work in the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Bristol. For the purposes of this chat, I'm mostly going to have my flooding hat on, and but I'm also interested in all sorts of other things, um, different parts of the water cycle and definitely in lots of different places. Now, I know we're here today to talk a little bit about impacts of climate change on the water system. Um, and I know this features quite heavily in both of the work that we do, but mm -hmm. maybe Ross, you can, you can kind of start off by, by outlining, you know, what, what your thoughts are about the impacts of climate change on the water system and what might change in the future. We definitely anticipate significant increases in temperature. So we expect the atmosphere to get warmer. That means quite a few different things for hydrology, but one of the things that's important that it means is that the atmosphere can hold more water. And if the atmosphere can hold more water, that means that it can bring bigger rainstorms to places. And so we can get we have now the potential with a warmer, a warming atmosphere for more intense rainfall. What does that mean for floods? And kind of the obvious answer is, well, heavy rainfalls cause big floods. So if the rainfalls get bigger, then I guess the floods will get bigger. And that is what you might think, but sometimes nature has a way of um, coming up with surprises for us. And I think there is potentially one there. The way that floods get made is not always really straightforward. So sometimes it just rains really hard and it lands on your pavement or something like that. And then the water runs across the pavement and into some drainage system. And if you put more rain on the pavement, you get more rain water in your drains. That's fair enough. But sometimes floods get made because of a combination of how much it rained and what state the soil was in, how wet the soil was when it was raining. So if it was that the heavier rainfalls that we got with climate change, if they came at a time of year when the soils were really dry, then maybe they wouldn't have much impact. Mm. And maybe what would really matter would be how much the rainfalls increased at the time of year when the soils are really wet. So in the UK, that would be in the winter time. So I think the thing is that because hydrology does the, the land surface processes when rain arrives on the ground, because those do interesting and complicated things, then sometimes the impacts of climate change aren't quite what you'd expect. Yeah, and often forgotten a little bit. We really regularly kind of focus on, you know, the climate change impacts and we think, right, changes in rainfall, changes in temperature. And, you know, that's kind of what's going on in the atmosphere. And often I think occasionally we sometimes miss that link between what's happening on the land surface. And then those surprising elements of how those terrestrial water fluxes modify that climate signal to produce either a flood or a, or a drought. So for the UK, um, the UK sort of future climate projections. They are projecting that we'll get wetter winters and drier summers. Now, overall, if you kind of average that out across the year, overall, it kind of looks like we might get a small, you know, mean increase in rainfall. So you think, great, great for droughts, right? Um, we won't- Bit more water in the rivers in the summer. Exactly, bit, bit more water in the rivers in the summer. But because of the ways 
that we require water and we need water for you know public water supply so the water that's coming out of your taps uh, and for agriculture um you know we need lots of that water in the summer and our water supply system isn't really set up to store a whole load of water that comes in the winter to then be able to supply through the summer so although we might get a small mean increase in our rainfall can lead to some water shortages because of those really severe decreases in rainfall in the summer. So those preventable consequences, do you think, or ones we can reduce? So James Bevan, who's the chief executive of the Environment Agency, gave a really interesting talk. I think it was a year or two years ago now. As part of that speech, he said that, you know, many areas of the UK will are projected to face severe water shortages by 2050, unless we do something now. In terms of what we can do now, I think one of the key things is that this is really an interdisciplinary problem. You know, you've got the water supply, which is kind of more of the physical science side, you know, how rainfall and evaporation transform themselves into a change in river flow. But then you've got water demand, which is very much, you know, more in a social science kind of realm. It's looking at behaviours of water patterns and water usage. It's thinking about how we can change behaviours so that you don't leave a tap running, for example, whilst you're brushing your teeth. We need to work as an interdisciplinary community to be able to address some of these challenges. The other thing I think that we can do to address this, we've got lots of wonderful hydrological models uh, that provide us with project projections of how flows might change in the future. I think those models need to be better adapted to reflect some of these water demand issues. Yeah, lots of those models We've used them to put water, to figure out how much water is at the beginning of the land cycle and effect, where it's the inflows to reservoirs or the recharge to groundwater. But there's actually a whole lot of other stuff going on. What about the solutions do you think on the flood side? Where do you think, yeah? Well, as, as cities are built at the moment, there's not, there's not so much opportunity for water to be affected by the soil conditions of whether things are dry or wet or not. There's a lot more of the paved areas and things like that where you can't really store any water. And in those places, it, it's actually quite a challenging problem. It's quite a big infrastructure problem because the pipes that we use to carry that stormwater around, um, it's quite tricky to make them bigger. So yeah, I think one of the big challenges for cities is finding more space to put water when it first arrives on the ground. And for cities that are already really densely inhabited, that's a big challenge. In the countryside, it's a slightly different story. I was going to, I was just about to ask you, what do you yeah. think about, you know, nature-based solutions and, and in particular natural flood management? Because uh, this is yeah. something I'm really interested in as well. Natural flood management, it's the idea that in places where there's space, we might be able to hold back some of the water during a flood. Examples of that might be um, putting lots of pieces of wood and tree branches in a stream to partially block the stream so that it slows it up a bit. Another option is um, making use of ditches as places to store water during floods. So this is good because it means that not all the rain that falls now has to be discharged into the stream right now that we can slow it down which is a good thing, for these kind of nature-based solutions to work, we really need to implement them in a lot of places. Yeah. Because the floods that we see in really big rivers, those are made from the accumulation of water in lots and lots and lots of tiny little streams that all join together. And those are all starting 
on the properties of individual landholder, landholders. And for this kind of natural flood management to make a difference, we need to do that when the stream is still really quite small. Yeah. Um, because once you've got a river that's five meters wide, you're not really going to be able to put anything in there that's going to hold any water back unless it's a huge engineered structure, basically. So if we want the nature-based approach, we need to do it in small and in many, many places, which means talking to an awful lot of people because it's their land. Yeah, and I think um, uh, the, the gov government's sort of on quite a big drive at the moment to plant more trees um, across the UK uh, for various benefits, not, not, just, for, not just for water. Um, and finding space for that to happen and planting those trees critically in the right places so that they don't have unintended consequences on other aspects of the water cycle is really is really important. Yeah, I, I think that tree thing is a really multi-dimensional idea. There's lots and lots and lots of interesting impacts. If you put trees in instead of grass, then you get drier soils. And that's a good thing from flood reduction point of view, because if the soil is drier, there's more space to store water in it. And in the UK, having space in the soil to store water is the main way that um, is a major control on the size of floods. Some of it has an effect on your interest in droughts. I wonder if you want to tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so from a, a droughts perspective, you know, following on from your Good description of what happens you know when you plant plant a tree if you've got got less rainfall entering the soil system so your soils are drier you've got less water then you know flowing into your or kind of moving through the soil system into your rivers but also you have less water recharging your groundwater systems now groundwater systems are really important because they sustain quite a lot of water supply during the summer when rainfall is really low in the groundwater system, you know, that rain takes a long time to travel from hitting the land, going through the soil system and then moving through that aquifer. Um, and so often in groundwater systems, you just get a nice steady kind of base flow all throughout the year. Now, if you plant trees, um, might find that that base flow starts to get reduced and so we don't get that additional water that we would usually get in the summer we don't get that water that's recharged you know from winter rainfall that's recharged back through the system and so what might be good for floods might not be so good for droughts i guess there's lots of other dimensions of the tree planted question that kind of outside the areas that we work in, things like um, impacts on animal habitat and mm. um, carbon capture, those sorts of things, which are not really our field. They're also a really important part of deciding what would be a good policy for how we use our land and where would be really good places to plant trees, where would be places we might like to avoid. And building up the evidence base for that is actually is quite challenging because as you said we need to test it in a number of places because we know that you know the terrestrial water system will act in interesting and surprisingly different ways depending on where we plant the trees we need to test that for a range of con conditions and i don't know about you ross but Every time I've embarked on a project to study droughts, it's inevitable that, you know, the next five years, there will be absolutely no droughts during, <laughs> during that period. <laughs> I think it draws back into that interdisciplinary nature of, you know, we need to think about ecology and societal benefits of having a woodland and not just the impacts that it has ultimately um, on on the river flows and would you say that on balance you'd expect the impacts of tree planting on droughts to be positive would it improve the drought situation or might it actually increase the risk of droughts it would kind of depend on the drought event and where 
Okay, it's a bit more subtle. What do you think? Do you think there is a definitive answer? Well, I think that in the places where the trees are planted, less of the water is going to get into aquifers and into rivers. So I think that in those places, I think that there's going to be less water available than there would have been. And so, yeah, I, I do think that the risk of droughts is likely to increase if those trees are planted in places that are at the moment um, an important part of the water resource. Yeah. But yeah, I think in this case, there's been enough experimentation to know which direction the effect goes in. The tricky bit is about saying, well, because there are a whole bunch of other benefits, like the benefits for reduction in flooding, for carbon capture, for improved habitat, um, figuring out how to weigh those up. And yeah, that's quite tricky. What do you think the major challenges are on the flood side? The reason that floods are the size that they are is a huge combination, lots of different things to do with lots of different dimensions of the climate and also how the land's being used and what kind of soil is there, what geology and geological history it's derived from. Um, yeah, there's a huge number of things all tangled up together. And then when someone asks you a question about, well, what if I was to change one piece in this puzzle? If I was to change just the intensity of their rainfall, but nothing else, or I was to change just the way that the land is used, but nothing else. That, for me, that means I have to know exactly what part in the puzzle the soil piece was playing or the land cover piece was playing, or the climate piece was playing. And at the moment, what we get to see when we make measurements of what's happening in rivers is a combination of lots and lots and lots of different things. Yeah. yeah so for me, for me, that's a big science challenge is, is untangling all of those pieces. Mm. And then when you get to kind of a, a policy point of view, taking, taking those, you know, very tricky kind of science recommendations and turning those into a series of, you know, adaptation measures to ensure we're, you know, in, we're resilient, I guess, to, yeah. to future events, I think is, is really challenging. In the end, I guess people still have to make decisions. <laughs> um, and so I think one of the challenges for us is being able to say how confident we are yeah. or not and how to have that information about confidence be useful to the people who are trying to make the decisions. Because if someone asks me and I say, um, I think it's this much, but I really don't know. I mean, that's really not very helpful at all. Hmm. Just to say, I'm uncertain. But on the other hand, if I'm just to say, oh, the answer is, 82 cubic meters per second, that's not being very honest because I'm, I know that I don't know the answer yeah. that precisely. So yeah, handing over just the right amount of information about my uncertainties yeah. is yeah, a challenge. been thinking about is also the the speed at which we need to make some of these decisions so you know we have a climate that's you know quite rapidly changing we have a human population that is quite rapidly changing dealing with those non-stationary aspects particularly when we don't have historic events to kind of base our understandings on, I think is a, is a really interesting challenge. There's, you know, how do you deliver the right information, but also at the right time? Uh, 
is we haven't really been used to planning for change. Yeah, we kind of, we get in the habit of thinking of building stuff to suit the way things are now. And it's, I mean, although in the technical fields that we work in, that idea of dealing with change is something we've been working on for 20 or 30 years probably, getting that into the mindset of the entire society is quite a big challenge. That's a, it's a sort of cultural shift almost that you don't expect the future to be quite like the past. How do you think poly policymakers might be able to adapt to these changes or what do you think we need to be doing now to better adapt to these changes? Um, some of it is working with them on developing scenarios for how things might be different in the future or sort of imagining the future, mm. imagining a scenario where we were very short of water for some reason and we could create a scenario that helps that happen that seems believable now but it might not be quite the right one. We can have the opportunity to imagine bits of the future at least. I think that would be would be really productive and it's I guess it's not just policymakers that that you would need to build those scenarios and talk through those scenarios with it it would be farmers and land use policymakers and uh, a whole host of other other people yeah people who might use water Indus industries water for food production or energy production or waste management all kinds of things for dilution So maybe, Jim, do you want to say a bit about what sorts of things make Bristol an interesting place and an, yeah, an interesting place for you to do this kind of work? I'm in a good place uh, to be able to talk about that because I, uh, I did my undergraduate at Bristol a very long time ago now. Uh, and I, I've never left, <laughs> which I think, I think tells you um, something about hopefully the strength and diversity of the water group um, at Bristol. I think we are incredibly fortunate to be part of a really thriving and interdisciplinary group and one of the things that I think makes the water group at Bristol quite unique is that we have you know a, a lot of people who work you know kind of in in similar areas but on different aspects um but we have a lot of people kind of who call themselves you know a hydrologist or a um water resource specialist um or someone who looks at the social aspects of water for example um and that means that we have these conversations frequently, you know, about how we can translate um, our science into something that has impact. And also we've spoken a lot in this discussion about, you know, interdisciplinary uh, measures and kind of working as part of the, the water group also through Cabot, um, I think, is is a really great way to kind of fuel those collaborations. Yeah, so I moved here about eight years ago. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed is the feeling that I'm in a team environment. And I really enjoy that a lot. I'm just tremendously lucky with the people I get to work with. It's fantastic. Ross, what's your key point you would like to get across to policymakers about the impacts of climate change on the water system? The thing that I'd like to say is if you're going to use 
planting of more trees as one of the ways of reducing the impacts of climate change, then try to look beyond just the impacts on the carbon cycle and on carbon storage, carbon capture, but also think about the impacts on the water cycle, that planting more trees has a positive effect on the water cycle from the point of view of, in some places, reducing the size of floods, which is really great because floods are a significant source of damage for society. But also think about the impacts of planting trees on droughts because planting trees is likely to exacerbate, make worse the risk of droughts. So just a plea to weigh up all of those factors when you're looking for recommendations about how to mitigate impacts of climate change. So Gemma, if you were to have one message for policymakers about the impacts of climate change, what would you say to them? I would say that a lot of the impacts of climate change are going to be felt through the water system. So whether that be increased rainfall potentially um, resulting in a in a flooding event that you know impacts homes and families or whether those changes in rainfall will result in more droughts that means that we need to think about public water supply and um, how much water we have to irrigate crops it's not just changes in our climate that are important but it's thinking about how those changes in rainfall and temperature get translated into a change in how water moves through the terrestrial system. And so to engage with hydrologists, um, to think about how those impacts of climate change will, will manifest themselves.